Okay, and if all sergeants will start their recordings, and I have the PC running right now. Recording to the cloud, all set. Backups rolling. And Keith, will you start with the opening statement? Thank you. Good morning and welcome to the remote hearing on a committee on cultural affairs, libraries and international intergroup relations. Will council members and staff please turn on their video at this time? Once again, will council members and staff please turn on their video at this time? Thank you. To minimize disruption, please place all cell phones, electronics to vibrate. You may send your testimony at testimony at council.nyc.gov. That's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Chair, we are ready to begin. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's hearing. I am council member Jimmy Van Bramer, chair of the Committee on Cultural Affairs, Libraries, and International Intergroup Relations. Today, we are joined by several council members, uh, members of the committee, but also the sponsors of two pieces of legislation that we're hearing today. So first I wanna recognize council member Dharma Diaz, member of our committee, and I see council member Francisco Moya, also a member of our committee. And as special guests, we have uh, council member Mark Levine, who has introduced an important piece of legislation uh, that he will talk about, and also council member Idanis Rodriguez, who has also introduced an important piece of legislation that we'll be hearing today. I wanna to welcome uh, all of them. As I mentioned, uh, we have three pieces of legislation that we are considering at today's hearing, but uh, I would be remiss if I did not start by addressing that so much has happened since our last hearing. Uh, the details and guidelines for open culture, the open culture program that we're so proud of, uh, have been released. Uh, we have a new president. Uh, the state announced an upcoming series of New York pop-up performances in New York City, and everyone is recognizing how vital arts and culture are to our revival uh, and a just recovery. We've seen new support for the arts coming from Washington, D.C., as Majority Leader Chuck Schumer has uh, heeded the calls of, of so many uh, to save our stages, save the arts, which really are the soul of our city. And I'm very proud to have been the prime sponsor on Open Culture. And we are thrilled that coming very soon will be the first of its kind uh, ticketed performing arts events breaking out all over the streets of New York City. And with the weather, we hope at some point warming up and we hope sometime not having snow uh, on the ground, we will see dance and song and comedy and acting uh, all over uh, the city of New York. So we hope everyone is uh, staying tuned and all of our cultural partners are applying to be a part of this program. Uh, we're moving the needle at a time when the cultural community needs it most. This will be the fourth hearing uh, where I'm opening by talking about arts and culture in this incredibly important sector in New York City as the second hardest hit industry by COVID-19 uh, with regards to job loss after restaurants. And and cultural workers need us. Which brings us to today's hearing. Uh, we're focusing on legislate, legislation uh, aimed at addressing several important projects. Introduction 1814, uh, which I've sponsored, relates to the selection of outdoor works of art for the Percent for Art program. Introduction number 2048, sponsored by council member Mark Levine, is related to creating a frontline worker memorial task force in New York City. And introduction number 293, sponsored by council member Idanis Rodriguez, uh, relates to the creation of a Freedom Trail Task Force to recognize, commemorate, and memorialize our city's 
history with slavery and the Underground Railroad. I'll talk a little bit about uh, my piece of legislation and then ask council members Levine and Rodriguez to speak about their important bills. Intro 1814 would require that at least 50% of all chosen artworks funded through the Percent for Art program be installed outdoors and require that more information about these public works be posted online, which I believe will also fulfill an aim of bringing more art to people in New York City neighborhoods and allow for our city to have public art more accessible in every neighborhood across this great city of ours. Now I will ask my colleagues, uh, council members uh, Levine and Rodriguez uh, to speak to their legislation. Uh, we currently have a foundation run African-American Freedom Trail in lower Manhattan which sites uh, all around City Hall, with sites all around City Hall. And I'm proud that we are hearing these important task force bills to move the conversation forward uh, about the importance of embracing and understanding uh, our history, especially during Black History Month. And of course, with regard to Council Member Levine's bill, as we begin to, we hope, emerge from this horrific pandemic um, and recognize the heroism of so many workers. So with that, I want to call first on Councilmember Mark Levine uh, to speak about his important piece of legislation. Thank you so much, Chair Van Bramer. Thank you for everything you've been doing to fight for arts during this crisis and for expediting a hearing for this bill, Intro 2048, which is so critical, I believe, uh, to this city um, we are approaching the first year anniversary of the start of this pandemic and of the dates in which we began to lose loved ones in the city. Uh, this is a crisis which has been defined by inequality, uh, not just inequality in healthcare and housing, but also inequality in employment. And one of the major drivers of the disproportionate impact that COVID-19 has had on New Yorkers of color is disproportionate presence of this community amongst those essential workers who have been out there serving us, caring us, caring for us, protecting us throughout this crisis. Workers in mass transit, workers in healthcare, workers in supermarkets, workers uh, on fire trucks and ambulances who never stopped, never stopped over the last year and have put themselves at risk in the process has paid a price in the process. We believe that thousands of essential workers have died because of COVID-19. It's a staggering loss, one that I don't believe we have adequately accounted for and one which we must pay homage to and memorialize. And so I'm thrilled today that we're hearing legislation, again, intro 2048, which would do what we did after 9-11, would create a commission, a commission to form um, to plan uh, for creation of a memorial to essential frontline workers that we have lost in this crisis. Uh, this commission would consist of two frontline workers themselves, also city commissioners from the Parks Department and the Department of Cultural Affairs and other appointments by the mayor and the city council. And this, this uh, commission would be charged with identifying locations and a design for a memorial to essential workers within nine months of uh, passage of this legislation. We know this takes time. Uh, we don't wanna wait until after this crisis is over to begin the process of coming together as a city to, um, to begin to reckon with this loss and how we can memorialize it. Um, I'm really grateful that we're hearing the bill today. Um, and I wanna acknowledge some of the staff of the committee who have worked so hard uh, to bring this bill uh, forward, including Brenda McKinney and Christy McGuire, Christy Dwyer, and my own legislative director, Amy Slattery. Uh, thanks again, um, Chair Van Bramer, for hearing the bill today. Uh, back to you. Thank you very much, uh, Council Member Levine, for this uh, important piece of legislation. And we were thrilled to uh, put this on the fast track uh, because 
it's it's that important and we appreciate your work on it. Uh, we're also thrilled to have council member Idanis Rodriguez uh, with us today to speak about his incredibly important and timely uh, piece of legislation. Council member Rodriguez. Thank you chairman and thank you for your commitment, dedication to support effort to research and celebrate the contribution of all Americans. And that's the future of our nation. And no doubt that uh, New York City today is not the same one that we have at the beginning of the 20th century, where more than 90% of the population, they were white. Today, New York City population is 29% Latino, 27% African-American, 15% Asian. The rest of us, Irish, Jewish, Anglo. So we are the, the great, a, a diversity sitting. I feel that as my experience as a former social study teacher for 15 years, more than my 11 years that I have as a council member, take me to go to Boston in a number of occasions, teaching social study, teaching American history, where we went and walked through the freedom trade site that they have in Boston. Why we don't have it in New York City? It's a matter of time. It's a matter of the new generation. I'm so proud that I know that we have the most progressive class of the council that we have ever had in our history too. So this is our time. Uh, the importance of creating the, the, the task force that will study the feasibility to create the freedom trade is so especially important that if we have in this discussion in this month where we celebrate the, sac the, the contribution and struggle or the African-American community, our brothers and sisters, that showed it to show that we were to turn our city as a city full of opportunity. History is so important. And that's why the most important group that we have in New York City dedicate their holiday to talk about the history and how that's so important for the present and the future generation. Taking the children to the site that represent the history is important for everyone. So with this plan, with the Freedom Trade Task Force, uh, we hope to see a group that will be studying the feasibility to create walkable site associated with the abol um, abolitionist movement and the Underground Railroad, including those sites already marked and others that should be marked. Those sites should be important for the rest of New York City and for all visitors. Thank you to Jacob. Thank you, who has been a champion advocating with us. Thank you to, to you, Chair. And we hope again that as our nation and our city was built uh, of the back of Afro-American, of the African-American, we should celebrate the fight, the struggle, and the important contribution that they make to, to our city. Gracias. Thank you very much, Council Member Rodriguez. Uh, this is, is incredibly important. Uh, and it is part of the uh, citywide, nationwide, worldwide reckoning um, with uh, white supremacy. So uh, appreciate your efforts on uh, all of this. I do wanna uh, recognize folks from the administration who are here today. We have Commissioner Gonzalo Casals um, joined by uh, Kendall Henry. I don't know if Kendall is testifying, but uh, Kendall Henry, the director of the Percent for Art uh, program, is here with us. And uh, Lisa Krasavage, I hope I'm saying that correctly, um, executive director of the Landmarks Preservation Commission uh, here as well. And our committee staff will let me know if I have left anyone uh, off. But I want to thank uh, Commissioner Casals. Uh, for his incredible work and um, advocacy on behalf of the cultural community in the city of New York. Thrilled to have him as our commissioner. And I wanna thank all the members of the community, uh, the cultural community and uh, others who are joining us today. And here we have a very healthy amount of people uh, viewing the hearing today. So we're thrilled with that. Um, let me thank uh, my staff, our Legislative Director Jack Bernadovitz, my Chief of Staff Matt Wallace, uh, our Council Committee 
uh, or committee council rather, Brenda McKinney, uh, Christy Dwyer, our policy analyst, and Alia Ali, our principal financial analyst, uh, for all of their work on all of these pieces of legislation and for everything they do on this committee and on behalf of the cultural community. Uh, I'm told that we also have Anthony Fabra and Timothy Fry from the Landmarks Preservation Commission as well. So with that, I think I am going to throw this back to our counsel, Brenda McKinney, who will set the stage uh, for this hearing and we will start to hear testimony. Thank you so much, Chair Van Bramer, and good morning, everyone. Um, so before we start and move to the administration and Commissioner Casals um, and our guests from LPC, I'm just gonna go over several procedures for today. So I'm Brenda McKinney. Uh, I'm counsel of the Committee on Cultural Affairs, Libraries, and International Intergroup Relations at the New York City Council. Um, I'll be moderating today's hearing and I will be calling on panelists to testify. So before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that you will be on mute until I call on you to testify. And then after you are unmuted, you will be, after you are called on, you will be unmuted by the host. When you are unmuted, a little box will pop up on your screen and you have to accept the unmuted mute um, and there is about a two second delay just so just so you know. Please listen for your name. I will periodically announce who the next panelist will be. Uh, for council members, questions will be limited to five minutes and council members please note this includes both questions and witness answers. Please also note that we will not be having or allowing a second round of questions at today's hearing. For public testimony and members of the public, I will be calling up individuals in panels, and today we only have one panel. So I will be calling everyone at once, um, just to let you know that the people that are coming and then individually, um, we do check at the end if there's anybody that we inadvertently miss. So don't worry if you don't hear your name. Um, Apologies. Um, again, if you uh, hear your name, someone from our staff will unmute you and the sergeant at arms will give you the go ahead to begin speaking um, after setting the timer. Today, all public testimony will be limited to two minutes. Um, again, after I call your name, please wait a brief moment for the sergeant at arms. Uh, so today I will begin by calling um, the administration to testify. So we'll call everyone's names and then I will deliver the oath after I call your names and call each person individually to answer the oath. So we will unmute you as well. Uh, so now the following members of the administration will be testifying. Gonzalo Casals, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. Kendall Henry, Director of Percent for Art at the Department of Cultural Affairs. Lisa Kursavich, apologies in advance for any mispronunciations, Executive Director of the Landmark Preservation Commission. Uh, Anthony Fabra, Director of Community and Intergovernmental Affairs at the New York City Landmark Preservation Commission. And Timothy Fry, Director of Special Projects and Strategic Planning at the Landmark Preservation Commission. Um, so I will now administer the oath to all of you. If you can please raise your right hand, members of the administration. Thank you. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to this committee, uh, before this committee, and to respond honestly to council member questions today? Commissioner Casals. I do. Thank you. Mr. Henry? I do. Ms. Krasavich? I do. Thank you. Ms. Uh, Mr. Fabra? Mr. Fabre or Fabra, I, we see you. I'm sorry, we'll we'll try to unmute you. Oh, I think you're muted again. Just one moment. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I do. Thank you. And then Mr. Fry. I do. Thank you so much. Okay, um, apologies for technical difficulties. And that is the oath. So thank you and Commissioner Casals, you may begin your testimony when ready. <clears throat> thank you, Brenda. Good morning, I'm Gonzalo Casals, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs here to testify regarding the proposed legislation. I am joined today by Kendall Henry, Director of Percent for Art at the Department of Cultural Affairs. 
I'll begin with intro 1814 of 2019, which would require at least half of all the artworks funded through the Percent for Art um, program be installed outdoors. We're grateful for Chair Van Bremer's and Majority Leaders' combos um, advocacy for the percent of our program in recent years. You have a spearheaded and updated funding formula for the first time in the program's history and expanded the community's voice in the art selection process. So thank you for that. Percent for Arts has commissioned more, over uh, 400 artworks in the last 35 years. One driving inspiration for all percent projects is commissioning art that is publicly accessible. Sometimes this is indoors, like in libraries and schools. Other times this is outdoors in a park or a plaza. Looking back, about 40% of all projects commis commissioned through Percent for Art are outdoors. That figure increases to 70% when looking at only Percent for Art projects, not including school buildings, where much of the artwork is located indoors. All of them are publicly accessible. This results from the Percent for Art team working in close collaboration with construction agency and local communities throughout the program's history. The flexibility to integrate artworks into each project has been a cornerstone of the program's success. Not only do indoor installations make more sense in many sites, but commissioner work out outdoors drastically increases project cost from fabricating with materials that are exposed to the elements, the installation, and the maintenance needs. The diversity of media from mosaics to murals to standalone sculptures are even innovative and even innovative interactive works also means that an ability to select between indoor and outdoor locations is critical to working with artists and residents to realize their visions. Thanks to council legislation, percent of our panels include robust representation from arts workers, community members, architects, engineers, and more. The current approach puts faith in their expertise to work with artists on selecting artworks that respond to each and unique site. We're always happy to have conversations about how to improve this program. We have reservations about a broad mandate to locate certain artworks outdoors. We look forward to discussing with you ways to ensure that Percent for Arts pieces remain open and accessible to New Yorkers. <clears throat> I'll now turn into intro 293 of 2018, which proposes establishing a task force to consider the creation of a freedom trail in the city. New York State fully abolished slavery in 1821. While we're still fighting for racial justice in our city even today, New York became a hotbed of activism and for slavery abolition and civil rights. Black New Yorkers have changed not only our city, but the whole world through their collective creative energy and over the, decade, the decades. Sites like uh, Wicksville in Brooklyn, Brooklyn and the location of uh, the former Seneca village were nearly forgotten, but in recent decades been better understood for the important role in American history. My colleagues and the Landmarks Preservation Commission have created a dynamic website that commemorates much of New York's own history related to abolition and civil rights and is reflected in our landscape. The digital map called New York City and the Path to Freedom was published last year and contains a remarkable collection of information that brings the courage and resilience of these figures, places, moments, and moments in history to life. Exploring ways to build and amplify of this amazing resource may be a more effective path forward. My colleagues from the Landmarks Preservation Com Commission will say more about their work in this area later in today's um, hearing. Finally, I'll turn to intro 2048 of 2020, which proposes creating a task force for a memorial to frontline workers who died from COVID-19. New Yorkers have all suffered and fought together for months against the isolation, fear, financial hardship, and loss brought by the pandemic. Our frontline workers help us to get through the toughest times, staffing hospitals, feeding us, and keeping our city moving. Far too many of them gave their lives to meet our society's most basic needs. We owe them and their families a debt of gratitude that can never be fully repaid. We have no doubt that permanent memorials will help New Yorkers mark, remember, and process the times we are living through. While we have every reason to believe the end is in sight, the pandemic continues to range around us. Memorials are one way we collectively remember key events and periods of time, often traumatic ones. From the general's local disaster to September 11 attacks, our city has carved out space for remembering and reflecting on these painful transformative moments. 
Is it now the right time to establish a memorial task force while we're still trying to make sense of the different ways communities have been affected? While I'm not sure of the timeline in this legislation, I look forward to collaborating on efforts to commemorate those lost to the pandemic as the full scope becomes clearly in the months and years ahead. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Commissioner. Are we hearing from others? Uh, yes, Director, Executive Director Krasavage will also testify. Okay. Uh, Ms. Krasavage, uh, you may begin when ready, and then we'll take questions at the at the end. Okay, great, thank you. Um, good morning, Chair Van Bramer and members of the committee. I am Lisa Krasavage, Executive Director of the Landmarks Preservation Commission, here to testify regarding the proposed legislation of Intro 0293 of 2018. I'm joined by, today by my colleagues, Timothy Fry, Director of Special Projects and Strategic Planning, and Anthony Fabre, Director of Community and Intergovernmental Affairs. The Landmarks Preservation Commission is an expert agency responsible for protecting New York City's architecturally, historically, and culturally significant buildings by granting them landmark or historic district status and regulating them after designation. LPC's research department is responsible for identifying and documenting New York City's historic places. The nationally regarded department, nationally regarded, excuse me, department is committed to the highest standards of historical scholarship and archival research and to bringing complex issues to light. They've done considerable amount of research on the important role that New York City played in the effort to abolish slavery nationwide and to assist those seeking to escape it and the places that best tell that story. Intro 0293 proposes establishing a task force to consider the creation of a freedom trail in the city. We agree that New York City's places related to abolitionist history, the Underground Railroad, and 19th century free Black communities are most certainly worthy of enhanced recognition. We believe that building on existing efforts to preserve and interpret these places would be a more effective path forward than the legislation. Throughout the years, LPC has designated an impressive collection of sites that help tell the story of abolitionism and the Underground Railroad. The commission has designated 18 places with documented associations to the abolitionist movement, which are intact to that period, including the first free congregational church in Brooklyn, Plymouth Church in Brooklyn Heights Historic District, the Brooklyn Friends Meeting House, the La Martine Place Historic District in Manhattan, and the Curtis House on Staten Island, among others. The commission recently designated 227 Duffield Street in downtown Brooklyn for its long and documented association with noted abolitionist Harrius and Thomas Truesdale. In addition to its important role of identifying, documenting, and protecting such places, LPC has increasingly focused energies on raising public awareness of the histories embodied by designated landmarks and historic districts. In, as mentioned by our colleagues, in December 2019, LPC launched New York City in the Path to Freedom, which documents designated buildings associated with the multiple ways people and institutions engaged with the anti-slavery movement before the Civil War. It's a highly visual and interactive, and also includes a three mile walking tour in downtown Brooklyn, which I urge you all to take, um, a neighborhood that was very active in ab abolitionist activities and contains an incredible concentration of resources. We created this multimedia tool in the hopes that New Yorkers would be inspired by the stories of abolitionists who took great personal risks to house enslaved individuals and to publicly advocate for abolition. Finally, the National Park Service has already developed guidance for evaluating sites and properties with Underground Railroad history and LPC has adopted them as part of our evaluation. Further, the National Park Service has criteria for inclusion in their National Underground Railroad Network to Freedom Program. And it is important that these standards are applied in the identification of properties believed to have ties to the Underground Railroad. And LPC is adept at a, in incorporating these important federal standards into our own evaluation of New York City's abolitionist and Underground Railroad sites. Given LPC's expertise and extensive work in this area, we think future efforts to further recognize and interpret this important history should build upon our work and the proposed legislation is not necessary to pursuing these very important goals. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on this in intro. Thank you so much. Um, 
Chair Van Bramer, we do not have any council member hands raised, but we can move to questions for the administration at this time. Great, and obviously if there are any uh, questions from the other sponsors, you know, I'm happy to uh, have them go at any time, but uh, I will uh, start by uh, talking to Commissioner Casals a little bit. And of course, uh, if uh, Mr. Henry wants to uh, chime in, he can. As you mentioned in your testimony, I am a huge supporter of the Present for Art program and very proud of the work that this committee has done to expand it. And, and as you mentioned, there are so many important pieces that are in installations that are all over the city. And as someone who worked for the Queens Public Library before I became a council member, I am very familiar with some incredible projects like the Flushing Library, uh, among others. But, uh, you know, I think the intent of the legislation, and I'm sure you would agree, is, is to say that a city that has more public art is a better city, right? A, a city that has public art for everyone to enjoy in every neighborhood is, is a stronger city. And, and so maybe just talk a little bit about some of the, the successes you, you've seen in other places too. New York is great. We, we always say we are the cultural capital of the world, but you know, I, I have definitely been to cities all over the world and um, have uh, have seen a lot of public art, a lot of really incredible uh, works. And, and, and I think what we're trying to say here is that we can always and should always strive to bring more public art to the people, right? And, and so maybe you can share your, your own thoughts and experiences on that. Um. Good morning, Chair Van Bremer. Um, um, you know, once again, we're in complete um, alignment here and agreement to the point that I, I'm not sure I'm, I'm allowed to have favorites, but the uh, artwork at the Flushing um, Library, it's one of my favorites um, of them all. Um, I, I love, you know, that work um, so much. And I love how people engage with it. Um, I think, you know, um, it's important to um, start our conversations by um, just sort of um, revisiting a little bit semantics. Um, I think it, we should not use accessibility and outdoors as um, interchangeable words. Um, not every work that is outdoors is accessible. Uh, not every door, every work that it might be indoors in a public building is not accessible. And accessibility um, at, at the uh, percent for our um, program starts from the from the minute that you know the project starts, right? Not only by the uh, engagement as you has um, helped us um, create through a legislation of um, communities in, in, in the neighborhood or in the, in the location that the artwork happens, but it's also in the selection of the artists. And um, one of the um, concerns I have um, by this legislation is really um, if we're going to be moving um, a lot of work outdoors um, in hopes that that's um, visibly accessible to, um, to um, to more um, New Yorkers, we may be closing the door to a lot of artists that have benefited, um, even emerging artists that have benefited from participating in this project. Um, just you know, because of um, lack of expertise in working with uh, materials and in working with the constraints that it means to create um, outdoors work, but also to um, the cost um, that um, um, increases a lot. You know, as I said in my testimony, in the um, in, in fabrication, installation, and then maintenance of um, art outdoors work. Um, at the core of the um, um, Percent for Art um, project, there are guidelines um, that dictate and help um, make decisions to the multiple partners that work in this process um, that to make sure that the work is accessible, as accessible as it can be. An example of that is um, in a school, and this is also mostly for public buildings. Um, one needs to be able to enjoy and be able to um, access the artwork before even um, crossing a security checkpoint. 
right? Um, so any of us can um, go to any of the many schools that we have installed artwork, um, look at it, enjoy it without necessarily having to go through a um, um, security checkpoint, which is sometimes, you know, one of the ways in which um, many of our fellow New Yorkers feel intimidated and, you know, would, would make, you know, artwork um, not accessible. So um, that's, that's a little bit at the gist of that, right? We could certainly um, work together and look at examples in which work may have um, been a little more accessible, but I wouldn't just um, put it everything under the umbrella of indoor or outdoors because um, might create a, a, another unintended outcomes. Yes, no, I, I don't think we are uh, conflating those two things. And, and I think that we are uh, very aligned here. I mean, I would, I would just say that I, while I understand that a, an outdoor installation is uh, more costly uh, in, in the long run, certainly, it is, it is still sort of the unfinished business of, of our city that the amount of money that we allocate for percent for art needs to be dramatically increased. And if we did do that as a city, and uh, for example, you could help pay for that by taxing billionaires appropriately, um, and then you would be able to uh, be able to build and create incredible works of art, both indoors uh, and outdoors, uh, that lift up our people, right? And, and, and both create more opportunities for emerging artists as you and I both want to see happen, uh, get paid for their work, but uh, also to um, have some, you know, larger scale and, and, and important pieces all over parks and, uh, and streetscapes in the city of New York, which I think is, uh, is in fact a sign that our city understands what art uh, and culture means to people, right? That it is, it is sustaining, uh, it is inspiring, and it is, uh, it is something that I, I believe in. Um, and I know uh, uh, the sponsors, um, are of the two other pieces of legislation who I want to thank uh, are uh, not here, but um, I know uh, Commissioner Casals, you expressed um, support, of course, for a memorial for um, uh, uh, the folks we've lost uh, as a result of the pandemic. Uh, and, but, and the timing of that, but maybe you could talk a little bit more about that and vis-a-vis um, -vis the, the, the effort that Council Member Levine has laid out here. Thank you. Um, and I'm, it, I think it's a perfect segue, but I just wanna clarify that I agree with you that um, there's always room for more art in New York City, public and you know all kinds of art. And um, you always, had a, well, always have an advocate, advocate in me for that. Um, to the point that, um, you know, um, just another technicality, when we talk about percent for art, we're just talking a very discreet program, uh, which is um, artwork that is supported by investment on capital projects um, for the city. Uh, but that um, practice um, has been extended to the work that we do in schools, and it also extended to a, a lot of uh, public artwork that have been doing what we're using the same process um, that, um, again, make it, make sure that um, art, artwork is accessible, but also, also there's a process that engages um, communities in, in the creation of that. Um, in terms of the COVID memorial, and uh, in the uh, little experience that I have as a commissioner, but also in the last years following a lot of the conversations that have been happening around monuments and memorials, um, if there's one thing that we all learn is that we should not rush to um, jump to bronze and marble um, until you know we really understand um, what's what's the impact that um, um, in in this case the pandemic has had on our communities. Um, there, um, 
we're still the crisis is still evolving, as you very much uh, know. Um, I'm calling you from Jackson Heights, and a few blocks from here, there's people waiting in line on a food pantry um, to access food. Um, and as we continue, the crisis continue to unfold. We continue to um, understand better the multiple ways in which many different communities have been affected um, beyond health. Um, all that I'm saying is that uh, yes, um, we certainly need um, a, a, a way to uh, memorialize this, but it's also to give a way for our communities to um, make sense of the changes um, that have been um, affected in our lives. But at the same time, um, I just want us to um, just to make sure that um, we understand exactly what we're trying to do before we move forward with the process. Understood. And and Councilmember Rodriguez is. Uh, Freedom Trail uh, Task Force. Um, surely you and I can agree um, that the city has a lot to do in terms of uh, reckoning with the history of, of slavery and, and oppression. And, uh, and, it's, and in particular, recognizing and uh, marking the Underground Railroad. And, and so speak to that, um, you know, both Councilmember Rodriguez's legislation, but also the role that you see the department playing in, um, in making right what is so terribly clearly wrong. Yeah, and I, I believe that's another um, point in which you and I were in agreement that um, uh, when we talk about more arts for New York City, we're not necessarily just thinking of arts for art's sake, right? But, you know, arts that has a, 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 a tremendous impact on our communities and a project like this, for sure, right? You know, how we can use um, arts and culture to bring up um, moments in history that need to be um, not forgotten, and then they need to be highlighted um, to um, inform our society today. Um, I wanted to pass it to our colleagues at LPC to, um, to expand a little bit more on this notion. Great. Before you do that, I just want to recognize uh, we've been joined by Council Member Mark Jonai and I see Majority Leader Lori Cumbo as well. So I want to welcome the other members of the committee to the hearing. And now, uh, Lisa. Hello. Um... Sure. I mean, you know, absolutely. This history is just incredibly important, and New York City's role um, is is incredibly important to you know the nation as well. So we certainly agree that that these are places that are worthy of you know more recognition. Um, it's something that we've been you know investing a lot of energy into, both in terms of the survey and identification and the designation of places that have this documented history and are intact, but also, you know, telling the whole story of New York and, you know, weaving together, you know, the, the narrative of how these places connect to that history. Um, and certainly we, um, you know, encourage different ways to do this interpretation as well. You know, we've been focusing now on um, digital platforms um, and we're experimenting with new digital platforms, um, you know, and I think the role of the arts and culture is important in that as well. Um, so it's something that we're certainly, you know, continuing to move forward and invest a, a great deal of energy into. Thank you. Um, I appreciate that. Do any other members have any questions for the administration on any of these three pieces of legislation? Um, if not, then we will go to public testimony. Um, Brenda, you let me know if. Chair, sure, we're not seeing any council member hands. If there are any council members, just one last check that have questions for the administration, please raise your hand in Zoom. Okay. Great. I believe that's so, it. With that, I'll say thank you again uh, to Commissioner Casals, Executive Director Kasavage, and your uh, teams. For being here, uh, I want to thank, obviously, again, Councilmember Levine and Councilmember Rodriguez for their important uh, pieces of legislation that that we've uh, 
introduced and, and heard here today, and uh, we will excuse the uh, administration panel, uh, although you're welcome to stay for as long as you'd like, and we will turn it over to Brenda to start the public testimony portion of today's hearing. Okay, thank you so much, Chair Van Bramer. Um, and thank you so much to members of the administration. Uh, so today, so now we will move to the public testimony portion of today's hearing. Wait, um, uh, Brenda? Oh, Brenda? Yes. I see Councilmember Rodriguez has his hand raised. Correct, apologies. So uh, I see Commissioner Casal is excellent, is still here. Uh, Councilmember Rodriguez? Yes, thank you. First of all, thank you, Chair, for your leadership. And, and, and I'm disappointed that the Landmark uh, uh, Commission uh, on behalf of City Hall is taking that position. And, and again, let's go, to, let's go to, to the Boston Freedom Trade, and you will see how much they publicize and how much they let people know this is the area that represents the history on of, 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 of Boston. When it comes to New York City, I, I never thought that an institution that is assigned to, again, identify historical site and as a social study teacher, as I said before, I do believe that this is important not only for our generation, but for the future generation. Instead of looking to expand what you're doing, you, you're comfortable to say that what you're doing is enough and, and and of course, I will continue pushing on this, working with my colleague, a thing that I have support with large, of large numbers, not only of members of the council, but also a lot of academic leaders, a lot of members of the historical society. So how, instead of looking to expand, creating, yes, a task force to study the feasibility, you come here to testify to be against it. Um, Lisa, you're muted. We're just working to unmute members of the administration. One moment. Uh, Ms. Krasavage, you should be unmuted now. Okay, great. Thank you. And um, council member, you know, I do want to really emphasize that, that we share, I think, um, the, the goal with you of, you know, it, getting more recognition, whether that's, a, you know, a trail of some sort um, or physical, you know, sort of markings. Um, there's a lot of different means to have that kind of trail. Um, you know, I think recognition of these places is important and we really, you know, share your goal with that. You know, I think it's just, you know, the matter of how we get to that shared goal um, is the issue. We're, we're not opposed to the idea of a freedom trail by any means. Um, you know, we're, we've um, included trails in our, um, you know, in our own, in a digital documentation and you know we're we're really wanting to tell this story because we agree that it's very important for future generations and today's generation and it's um you know new york city has a wealth of history that i think the world you know should see more of can we unmute councilmember rodriguez Apologies, there's a delay with unmuting. Um, okay. We're unmuting Councilmember okay. Rodriguez. And, and thank you. And, and, and I, I'm happy to hear that approach and that clarification. Uh, again, this is about getting to our goal. And hopefully, you know, with the chairman and all the new guys, we can continue having conversation to see how we can advance to that goal. You know, this is about telling the story uh, of Juan Rodriguez. You know, someone who was the first and non and, and Native American who said in New York City is not included in our history. It's not included about this is the potential area where probably when the Dutch brought Juan Rodriguez in 1613, he could be in this area. So, and this is about the abolition, abolitionism movement, you know, and, and, and again, I'm happy and it's not that I don't recognize your commitment, your dedication to you know, identify those sites. But for me, as someone that uh, came here at the age of 18, uh, that raising my two daughters, 14 and 13, knowing that they black, they Latina, they Dominican, I think it is important again to, you know, do the best you can. It's not only about the rage, the, the freedom trade. It's about when you look about DOE, like most of the books used by the teacher, it's like it doesn't reflect author who are black, who are Latino, who are Asian. So when you come to, 
you know, who, even when you look up on how in the past we, and, and thank you to the chair and former speaker, Melissa Margarito and us, we've been able even to change, make, bring some changes in the formula on how we distribute funding to the cultural institution. Because the one that we've been using is the same one that was established like decades ago. So it's not just about the freedom trade, it's about, for me, how we make decision to give the investment, the respect, the publicity. And, and I'm happy to hear again that it's not just about, you say, strong no, but it's about, it, again, how can we get there? And, and I do recognize the work that you do, and hopefully we can continue this conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Rodriguez, for your uh, passion and for never letting uh, this go and so many of the other fights that you have fought uh, for justice. It is uh, incredibly important. And, and Lisa, just to put a, put a finer point on it, uh, the administration is not opposed to Councilmember Rodriguez's bill. Correct. Well, I think what you know, I think we share a goal of you know seeing some ways to you know better enhance the understanding of these places, you know, and whether that's a freedom trail or other other means, you know, I think that that is definitely a shared goal. Um, you know, and LPC has done a lot to to recognize these places, and you know, are eager to work with colleagues to do more. Okay. Um... So I did not hear opposition uh, to the bill, which is good, uh, and uh, we will we will take that. Uh, and I realize you're you're uh, uh, you're speaking, you know, on behalf of uh, the greater team, uh, and and maybe you can't go uh, and say certain things, but um, I think we do believe in the urgency of this. Right, uh, that uh, we cannot delay justice, and and as Councilmember Rodriguez pointed out, right, there are inequities throughout our education system, and and we can't just have an app or something that you know seeks to tell this history. Right, it's got to be uh, public. It's got to be um, permanent, and and it's got to um, uh, force us to confront the history and then also um, uh, uh, celebrate some of the, the good uh, uh, and amazing parts of our history, um, like the Underground Railroad. Uh, I see uh, Councilmember Diaz uh, has her hand raised. I think Lori was just um, air clapping uh, there for a second. <laughs> but Councilmember Diaz. Am I unmuted? Yes. You're unmuted. Thank you, Council Member. Great. I, I just wanted to share the excitement at this end when I'm hearing my fellows um, supporting and, and endorsing the conversation that we're having here today and publicizing and acknowledging our history. And I share that to say I'm looking forward to opening uh, Afro Latino Museum in the 37 Councilmatic District. As, as I traveled, um, so we provide tours down to to up to um, Alabama, and um, was able to walk through the halls where Martha Luther King, you know, was a heroine. That, that you know, it, it brought me to wanting to highlight our history in the 37 councilmatic district where I represent. Uh, I think it's like 29 percent of African Americans, and the balance being Latino and Asian. It's important that we know our history. We, we stand on the shoulders of, of many. That is not to exclude the Anglo participation, but again, it's just important to me that we share for those to come, for our little people, right? That they know how we started, how we become. And in order for us to continue to succeed as a society, we need to have true conversations. So again, just letting you know my interest in, in establishing more visuals throughout the 37 Consumatic District. I wanna see some placards, you know? I, I live by, by Highland Park and, and Cypress Hills, and we have many mountains and many hills. And I'm told that George Washington, you know, ran through with horses, you know, um, on the very street where I live. Now, I, I want to be able to see more of, of those visuals. We also happen to have a national cemetery um, within our district. 
To me, that, that's a landmark. And, and it says a lot to the district that I represent that normally is only heard of for crimes and, and negativity. So then thank you for, for this conversation and looking forward to working on landmarking a lot of the, the positive visuals that we have in the 37 Consumatic District. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Diaz. And um, you have successfully mentioned that museum at virtually every hearing that we've had since you joined this committee. So <laughs> I want you to know that uh, that point is being made loud and clear, um, and, and I appreciate your advocacy. Um, uh, do we have any other questions from members of the committee or the council for the administration um, at this time, Brenda? Sure, I'm not seeing any hands raised in Zoom or um, physically. So I think that's it for questions from council members. Okay, uh, that's a then, <laughs> and I think uh, uh, we had a false alarm the first time, but now I think we are um, saying goodbye to the administration unless there are any uh, uh, questions from council members. Of course, uh, I encourage the administration to um, have uh, folks remain. Oh, I see Majority Leader Cumbo's hand raised. Yes, Majority Leader Combo is raising her hand. Uh, there's just a delay in unmuting you. We're doing that now, Majority Leader. I was you trying to raise this because you all had said it all so eloquently, and sometimes you don't need to re-say the same thing that everybody has already said so eloquently. But I, I will just continue to, I just want to stand in support of my colleagues. It's so incredible that, um, that this hearing and this conversation is taking place. I too have had the opportunity to go on uh, civil rights tours and to travel other cities and to really see how they uh, put forward their history of their city in such a proud and defining way. And we're really missing the boat here in New York City because we have such a great history to tell. And we're also, you know, there's some people that can only understand things based off of the economics. And so for those who don't see the value in this history, these civil rights tours and uh, ability for people to come and travel to New York City to see our uh, treasures and, and the history is a booming industry and business that New York City is not benefiting from. I'd also like to add with the Black Lives Matter movement, we've spoken at length to the administration in terms of what is the what is the response of the administration to the Black Lives Matter movement. And I can think of, you know, I can think of a gazillion things, but certainly this is a key response to the Black Lives Matter movement that this history, that our culture, that the true story of New York City is finally told. Um, you know, it's, it's really a reminder every time we walk through City Hall and we walk through many of our historical buildings, there have been a lot of efforts, not with the same level of investment, but there have been a lot of efforts to show the diversity of the city of New York and the true history um, of our city. So I, I think it's important because to see in places like Borough Hall and other places, to really only see white old men um, revered is really very telling um, of our city and what we value and whose stories we value. So I, I stand in full support of this. Um, it's important that we have this history told. It's important that we um, celebrate what has gotten us to this point. And I think this is a clear step and answer to uh, many of the demands of the Black Lives Matter movement and to show that Black lives have mattered will be chronicling the history and the contributions um, that they have made, that we have made to this city. So thank you so much, uh, Chair Van Bramer for hosting this hearing. Um, I've, I'm excited to hear from, uh, I see many fa familiar faces on this particular Zoom. So I look forward to hearing what they have to say and thank you so much. Thank you very much, Majority Leader Cumbo, uh, for your important contribution to this hearing, but also to this uh, uh, citywide and worldwide reckoning that is happening. And um, 
And with that, I want to say uh, thank you uh, to the administration. I hope we can work together quickly um, and with the same passion that uh, uh, Majority Leader Cumbo and, and Councilmember Rodriguez and Councilmember Diaz and so many others um, uh, bring to this discussion and, and pass these pieces of legislation and make sure that uh, the history, the full history of our city is uh, told and appreciated. Uh, with that, I'll hand it over to Brenda, who will call the names of the first panel of public testimony. Thank you so much, Chair Van Bramer. So with this, we've concluded the administration's testimony, and we will now turn to public testimony. For members of the public, please note I will call up individuals and panels, but today, as mentioned, we have one panel. So I will be calling up the five witnesses that we have registered. Um, if there is anyone we inadvertently missed, we will be calling names at the end. Uh, council members, if you have questions for a particular panelist, please use the raise hand function in Zoom and you'll be called on after everyone on the panel. So those five witnesses have testified in the order that you raised your hand. And for panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and then the Sergeant at Arms will give you the go ahead to begin after setting the timer. As a reminder, all testimony will be limited to two minutes today. Please wait for the Sergeant at Arms before you begin. Uh, so today we will start with the first panel. I will read the only panel. I will read uh, names in order um, and then call you one by one. Um, again, there is a delay in unmuting and you should see a box pop up, but um, apologies for the delay. So panel one is Jacob Morris from Harlem Historical Society and the New York City Freedom Trail Foundation. Dominique Barnuka Hood, apologies for any mispronunciations at, from Historic Richmond Town. Rachel Wallman, Wallman from Greenwood Cemetery. Julie Finch from Friends of Hopper Gibbons Underground Railroad House. And finally, Linda Nat Mullen from the Brooklyn Monthly Meeting of the Religious Society of Friends. Um, so with this, we will begin with our first witness, Mr. Morris. You may begin once the Sergeant calls the clock. Time begins now. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to thank, uh, I want to thank Councilman Rodriguez, uh, first of all, for his continuing support and, and uh, as he showed today, his, his passion and appreciation uh, for making this happen and working on making it happen. And um, I also want to thank uh, Chairman Von Bramer uh, so deeply for having this hearing today. Finally, <laughs> it's been a long time uh, that we've been um, hoping to get this uh, to committee so that you guys can vote in favor and get it to the floor of the council and we could make this happen for New York City. Uh, this is a task force to study how best to implement this. But um, if the examples of, um, of Boston, where the Boston Freedom Trail has done so much for Boston, it is by far the number one tourist attraction in Boston. And that's an appreciation for Boston's role in uh, the struggle for freedom from England. Philadelphia copied Boston and modeled their constitutional trail, which has only been instituted in the past 10 years. Um, and that is now one of the top five um, tourist attractions for Philadelphia. And that tells the story, of course, of Philadelphia's role in making a constitution uh, and, uh, and um, America with the Declaration of Independence. And, uh, the formation of our country. New York City has its own unique story, a great story, the story of the struggle for freedom from chattel slavery and the dignity of humanity, the fundamental dignity of humanity. Um, I have to point out that a lot of these sites don't exist anymore. Let's call it the creative destruction of New York City and its buildings. 
so many of these locations do not exist. They exist in the echoing halls of memory. But they can, they absolutely, historical scholarship confirms that they happened. The slave market at the foot of Wall Street, Frederick Douglass landing at the dock on the Hudson River, escaping from slavery, 1838. David Ruggles and his boarding house, where there happens to be a plaque that was passed by the Landmark Commission on a building that was built much later. So many of these locations, they just need to be recognized. And there is really an incredible concentration of these Underground Railroad and abolitionists um, and other major historically significant, major historical significant locations concentrated so that New York City can have a walking tour and a bicycle tour uh, and so on uh, that people can visit that will bring tourism, that will uh, uh, help our restaurants, that will help our culture, our children to bring history to life. Thank I want you, to thank Morris. everybody today uh, for, for moving this forward and supporting this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Morris. Uh, we will move to the next panelist. Um, and just a reminder, and I apologize for not saying this earlier, um, but we do have a two minute clock for testimony, which sometimes we go over, but your written testimony can be as long as, po as you'd like, and you can amend it up until the deadline. So the deadline for written testimony is 72 hours after the start of the hearing. Written testimony can be submitted to testimony at council.myc.gov. Um, so we review both oral and written testimony uh, meticulously. Um, so just a reminder, about written testimony as well. Um, so we'll move to the next panelist and then take questions from council members for panelists at the end. The next panelist will be Dominique Barnuka Hood from historic Richmond Town. Thank you. Time begins now. Thank you, Chair. And a uh, very special thank you, thank you to Councillor Rodriguez and members of the Committee on Cultural Affairs for hearing my testimony. My name is Dominique Hood, and I'm an educator at historic Richmond Town on Staten Island and a dedicated student of Afro-originated history. Historic Richmond Town has long been a preeminent catalyst for historical and preservation programming. And I rise today to speak today on behalf of our willingness and ability to provide research, consultation, and participation in the work laid out before this proposed task force, should this committee see fit to include the following site of Staten Island's key role in Afro-originated history and its connection to the Underground Railroad and those who sought the trail to their self-emancipated freedom. Afro-originated oystering communities were popular among free black settlements all along the East Coast during the 17th and 18th century of our nation's history. And the familial bonds and economic links between these towns are what laid the groundwork for the inherent solidarity of the underground resistance and smuggling to freedom which developed among these communities leading up to the Civil War. One particular example of this I wish to make known to this committee today is the village of Sandy Ground in the neighborhood of Rossville on Staten Island. Several prominent Afro-originated families moved to Sandy Ground in the 1840s from Maryland's Chesapeake Bay. This community became an indisputable hub of major abolitionist activity in the decades to follow as a result. And I mean no disrespect to the uh, executive director, I'm honored she's here, but this site has been given a measly total of 18 words um, uh, by the Landmark Preservation Commission database. And so when we talk about whether or not this task force is needed right now in this instance, as Rodriguez was talking about, that's what I'm talking about. The local church in particular played host to such integral I'm figures excited. as Harriet Tubman, Frederick Douglass, and Sojourner Truth. The historical significance of this landmark is undeniable in connection with the creation of a walkable Freedom Trail exhibit within our city. There may be few other locations within our body of New York City knowledge which have such an original link 
to diverse communities during the early colonial period. Stark is our island's political history of abolitionist rhetoric and actuation, as well as an unquestionable connection to the Underground Railroad and those who worked, fought, bled, and died for the emancipation of their fellow human beings. I submit this testimony in the name of this resilience, and I implore you to include Sandy Ground within the framework of this task force, which I hope is to be created. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Hood. Thank you. The next uh, panelist will be Rachel Wallman from the Greenwood Cemetery. Ms. Wallman, you are unmuted. When the sergeant calls the clock, you may begin your testimony. And begins now. Thank you so much. Good morning, and thank you to the two members of the committee and those um, others at this meeting, especially Chair Van Bramer, Councilman Rodriguez. My name is Rachel Wallman, and I am the Director of Education at the Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn. I'm speaking here to share Greenwood's support for the creation of a New York City Freedom Trail and some resources we could bring to bear toward this initiative and how we already interpret this history. Uh, for those unfamiliar with Greenwood, it is a 183 year old active cemetery a National Historic Landmark, a public art space and the most highly accredited Arboretum in New York City. Um, and admission is uh, free, 300 and, oh, am I still muted? No, I'm not. Okay, sorry. We can hear you. <laughs> for a second. Um, uh, admission is free 365 days a year. Abolitionist history runs deep at Greenwood. The Freedom Lots section of the cemetery contains the remains of 1,300 Black New Yorkers whose lives span the 19th century. We believe it is the largest known undisturbed Black burial ground in the Northern United States. Um, you, uh, sorry. High school interns helped restore this area in 2015 and gave it its moniker. Visitors to the Freedom Lots can read interpretive panels and a free virtual tour of the area is available on our website. Black and white abolitionist permanent residents are interred throughout the rest of Greenwood. Among them are Samuel Cornish, founder and co-editor of Freedom's Journal, the first black owned and operated newspaper in the United States. Elizabeth Gloucester, a black real estate magnate who gave funds to John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry and Abby Hopper Givens, who we've discussed already. Um, there and others monuments and grave sites are worthy of public acknowledgement. We tell the stories of these pioneers regularly. More than 60% of Greenwood's programs for pre-K through 12th grade um, discuss abolitionism and slavery. Greenwood also features abolitionists in public programs such as History Revisited, celebrating Greenwood's Black residents, featuring Councilman Robert E. Carnegie Jr., which is coming up on February 24th. Finally, Greenwood's archives include burial records that can assist scholars in researching Black New Yorkers I'm of the 1960s in unique ways. We support this effort and we hope to be a partner in this initiative. And we thank the council um, and the committee for their time. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Um, yeah, yes, we can. Ms. Finch, you are the next panelist. Um, you may begin when you start at 12 o'clock. Thank you, I'm very eager. <laughs> um, my name is Julie Finch and I'm co-chair of Friends of the Hopper Gibbons Underground Railroad House on 29th Street between 8th and 9th Avenue. I, I'm so glad to hear the support of Councilman Rodriguez Diaz and a majority leader, I'm not sure of her title, of Combo. Thank you very much for your support. Um, I have, one suggestion. I would like a memorial uh, for the 11 to 30 black men who were lynched during the draft riots of 1863. This has been ignored completely and I insisted that it be put on our plaque outside the Gibbons house and I'm very glad to say that Landmarks reconsidered and added it to their plaque. Um, I went on a tour with Christopher Moore from the landing downtown at I think Warren or Chamber Street where Frederick Douglass stepped off a boat. And I think that this is a very important idea and I support completely the Freedom Trail. Um, and especially the little house that belonged to um, Mr. Wright on West Broadway that is such an exquisite house. And I'm just mentioning that Louis Napoleon, the Underground Railroad conductor who helped us, um, he lived at, for a time on Staten Island. So I, I just wanted to say thank you for that. Um, so I also helped with the uh, 
landmarking of Duffield Street, which took 17 years. Our own Hopper Gibbons house took 10 years or approximately. And I think that more attention needs to be paid. And I support the Freedom Trail, an actual trail with actual markers. Um, I, thank you. I, I am glad that LPC has their app, but we need much more. And I would like to include indigenous people on the, on the trail. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Finch. I apologize for what I heard as a technical uh, glitch there. I don't know if everyone else heard that, um, but uh, I very much appreciate uh, you raising the draft riots and uh, uh, the lynchings that took place. Very few people know about the history of uh, what took place there. Um, do we have one more person testifying? Yes, correct, Chair Van Bramer. Um, so the, the last panelist will be Linda Nat Mullen. Um, if you can please turn on your video, Ms. Mullen, Nat Mullen. We might be having technical difficulties. If you can bear with us, we're just working on it, but we have one more witness. One more witness. One more witness. One more witness. So, Ms. Snap Mullen, we can hear you, but we do hear feedback. Uh, and I can see you're speaking, but you're on mute. Um, just one, one moment. Are we good now? Yes. Oh, great. Not only okay. we can hear you. So um, once the sergeant calls the clock, you can begin your testimony. Thank you so much. And sorry for the problem, the technical problem. Time begins. Uh, my name is Linda Gannett Mullen. I'm a member of the Library and History Committee of the Brooklyn Monthly Meeting of the Religious Society of Friends. Um, and I wanna thank everybody for the testimony so far. And I would like to add, creating a freedom trail in New York City would not only give New Yorkers and tourists a better feeling for the past, it would potentially create better feeling in the present. For too long, black agency in the abolitionist movement and the Underground Railroad has been downplayed or virtually eliminated from sight. Just a few people that few people know include Peter Kroger, a black Presbyterian minister and founder of the Brooklyn's AME Church and his brother Benjamin from Pearl Street in Brooklyn, who according to the Center for Brooklyn History birthed the anti-slavery movement in Brooklyn. There is also Louis Napoleon, a black conductor on the Underground Railroad, who with great strategic talent and daring helped approximately 3000 people to freedom and spent his last days in Brooklyn. There's Harriet Jacobs, who was once a frightened runaway fleeing to Brooklyn and Manhattan. She became an agent for Quakers in Alexandria, Virginia, just after emancipation, helping to distribute clothing and supplies and wrote an explosive anti-slavery memoir with a Me Too point of view. There are, of course, the Truesdales, black abolitionists who worked with William Lloyd Garrison, among others. And we thank the, L the land, land parks, <laughs> Sorry, the LPC for their work here. And uh, there are many more fascinating people to highlight. And in this comes an important point of why accurately pointing up the past can help the present and the future. The truth of the Underground Railroad that is emerging is that it was not an orderly system run primarily by white people. That is a myth established about 1898 by Professor Wilbur H. Siebert. The understanding we have today is that black agency was very important in the antebellum period and that black and white people work together in a worthy cause. This is so critical to get across. As Quaker historian Chris Redensmore states, somehow the emphasis shifted from the story of the enslaved seeking their own freedom, largely and almost exclusively without help from the Underground Railroad, to stories of how white people, often Quakers, aided fugitive enslaved people. By mid 20th century, the Underground Railroad story was often told as if the only actors were white and the freedom seekers themselves were passed from safe house to safe house. One must be suspicious of feel good history. 
So we truly welcome the development of a freedom trail in New York, and then it may let, allow all of us to understand the true history of the anti-slavery movement and will allow all of us to become a little more free. The truth does that. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Nat Mullen, and uh, appreciate that we were able to work out those technical glitches so we could hear your very important uh, testimony. I would first ask to see if any of my colleagues have any questions or comments about the five speakers who have spoken so eloquently uh, and powerfully about uh, uh, Councilmember Rodriguez's bill, which I think all of you addressed. Um, but I, I will just say thank you, um, uh, Mr. Morris, for um, uh, banging the drum very loudly here uh, and making sure uh, that this history is told and told uh, correctly uh, and appreciate your, your work on this. Um, and uh, to all of the others, um, you're all doing incredibly important work. Um, and it's important that more people know what you're doing uh, and, and the history that you are um, sort of excavating in many ways, right? History that has been um, buried or been uh, intentionally made to disappear and, and you are um, bringing it back and making sure that people know what really happened. And, and that's really, really important. Uh, so I want to thank all of you uh, for not letting it go um, and for insisting that the stories be told and that the history that has systematically been erased uh, is, is, uh, is retold um, and in ways that people uh, see it, feel it, know it, um, and when appropriate, celebrate it. Um, so I wanted to say thank you. And I don't know if any of my uh, colleagues have any uh, uh, last words to say, but obviously we will uh, push forward with um, uh, intro 293 and, um, and the other bills as well. Uh, we will keep working on, but I uh, just wanna say thank you for this important conversation. I'm really proud this committee has, uh, while passing open culture, um, has had several hearings um, that um, uh, that respond to the Black Lives Matter movement and have um, really um, leaned in uh, to this um, time, which of course is appropriate that all of our committees and all of our work does that, but this committee in particular. Um, so uh, with that, uh, unless anyone has uh, any last words from the council members, I will hand it back over to uh, Brenda McKinney uh, for some uh, housekeeping uh, before I close the hearing. Is that what I should do, Brenda McKinney? <laughs> Correct, Chair. <laughs> okay. um, thank you so much, Chair Van Bramer. So I also don't see any council member hands, either physically or in Zoom. So we'll um, move forward. Okay, um, so we'll move forward. So at this point, we have concluded public testimony. However, if we inadvertently missed anyone that would like to testify and who's logged in, please use the Zoom raise hand function and we'll call on you in the order that your hand is raised. So we'll just take a moment if there's anyone we missed, if you can please use the Zoom raise hand function. We're not seeing any hands. So Chair Van Bramer, um, we have concluded public testimony for this hearing. Thank you so much. Great. Uh, thank you very much to everyone who participated uh, and brought so much passion uh, and, and fierce uh, calls for justice uh, and the true telling of the history of the city. Uh, and with that, uh, this hearing is adjourned.